How's everybody? Good, 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 good. Come on in, everybody. I just wanted to announce that last year we had a very successful Work Baltimore Empowerment Employment uh, event at the Convention Center. That will occur again this year on September 26th and 27th at the Baltimore Convention Center. And we're really excited about this because last year, uh, I think we had over 4,000 people who walked through the Convention Center. I'm not sure, I know we're doing a closer measurement of how many people actually got get jobs uh, during that process. We know that uh, several of our agencies are involved in that. I know we hired at least one data scientist from the uh, event last year and many of the departments reported that they also uh, did that. Uh, leading up to this, they've had several workshops uh, to, to help people to really get ready uh, for this event. And so I'm gonna let Quentin talk a little bit about what we're doing there, but one of the big things that's happening is we're also providing an expungement clinic. And I know our city solicitor is gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, we find that many people in our city have uh, records that can be expunged. Uh, they don't know how to get it done. And so last year, working with the United Way, uh, when they were providing homeless services, we noted that they were also doing expungement services. So we wanted to emanate that and provide that service as well. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, our commitment to serve the city of Baltimore citizens and stimulate the city's economic growth was behind the idea to bring together stakeholders at the same place and at the same time, those job seekers and those stakeholders in the community that are looking to fill positions. And I'd like to first just thank uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Mayor Pugh, for her unrelenting support of not only Work Baltimore, but of the ideal of ensuring that every city resident has the opportunity to meaningful employment. Uh, so we present to you the second annual Work Baltimore Empowerment to Employment Convention. Uh, currently, we have 17 industries represented, uh, 110 total exhibitors. Uh, that includes 36 uh, or 24 resource vendors. Those resource vendors uh, attempt to provide resources to citizens who have found barriers to employment. And we have 86 employers looking to fill over 300 positions over the two-day course of Work Baltimore. Uh, we have supporters and uh, 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 exhibitors such as BGE, Johns Hopkins, h and Bakery, Towson University, Horseshoe Casino, LifeBridge Health, all are uh, supporting Work Baltimore, providing positions, trying to fill positions. Also, there are a couple of new initiatives to this year's Work Baltimore that I just wanted to touch on. The first, Madam Mayor already discussed, and that is the uh, expungement piece. Expungible arrest and criminal records remains a barrier to employment for many city residents. We are partnering with the law department to see how we can assist job seekers in providing information and helping them in that regard. Also new for this year is Network Baltimore. And what Network Baltimore does is provides an opportunity for everyone from uh, the uh, new professional to the uh, C-suite executive, the opportunity to network with one another, to exchange information, to also engage in the seminars and workshops. And the thought is that even if the business professionals do not find sustainable or suitable employment at the convention, they will make business networks that will provide opportunities for employment organically as they continue to uh, build on those relationships. So we're very excited we, uh, about Work Baltimore this year. We anticipate, we already have over 1,000 people registered already who have registered early to be there. So we're anticipating a large crowd and we're anticipating filling all of those those 300 plus positions. Okay. Um, I want to also take a moment to thank the staff and all the folks who've worked so hard. Those are 300 positions in the private sector that we know of thus far. Everybody has not reported the jobs that they'll have available. Uh, also, we know that uh, many of our agencies will be there as well. Um, City Solicitor, you want to explain the thank expungement? Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you for your leadership on this. It is no exaggeration, as we all know, to say that the existence of criminal justice records about an individual poses one of the most formidable barriers to employment. And the issue of expungement can be very challenging 
and complex for some people in our city. And yet, there are simple answers that can be provided to these people. For example, a lot of people don't realize that not only arrest records can be expunged, but certain conviction records can be expunged. And so the law department, in cooperation with a, a broad number of private attorneys and other government attorneys, are running this expungement clinic throughout Work Baltimore, and we're very excited about it. And we're going to have a process that people will be able to do self-help on their, on their expungement, if it's a fairly simple matter, and get referrals to other lawyers for the more complicated cases. And this is very important to us, namely, we're going to continue this process even after Work Baltimore. It's an ongoing project of the law department. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people in this city who have criminal justice records, who can get rid of those records and open up avenue, avenues to employment. And it's, it's the mayor's commitment and our commitment to see that that happens in every way. So we're very excited about this project. I want to give a shout out to Sarah Gross, a chief solicitor in the law department for Baltimore City, who's really taken the leadership in this project. And we thank her for her work and all of the lawyers in the law department who are going to be volunteering throughout Work Baltimore. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. And expungement is also for people who are ineligible to vote right now due to expungement. Expungement is people not even sure if they can vote with some sort of record or arrest. Uh, is that sort of what you're looking for, especially coming to the midterm season? That, that's a great point. It it's one of the collateral consequences of certain criminal records. But if a person can get a record expunged, yes, they can restore their right to vote. That's not the focus of Work Baltimore, of course. We're focused on getting people employed. But certainly, the right to vote is, is, a, is an important constitutional right uh, that will be consequential to people as they go forward. Does the state already have banned the box laws that prevent employers from asking about criminal records? So how does expungement help? when employers already can't ask about it. Great question, because the ban the box gets a potential employee through the door, gets a potential employee to an interview. But then, at the interview, or the later stages of the screening process, the existence of the criminal record, or the criminal justice record, comes to light. And as you can hear from many people in our city, that's when they, the door closes on them. So getting the expungement piece completed means they can continue through the process and demonstrate their qualifications for the position. Great question. Steve? Uh, I was just going to say, how do people, if they want help, can they get in touch with the law department? How does it work? Well, they should register for Work Baltimore, first of all. That's the most important piece. And then whether they register or not, show up on the 27th and the 28th okay. at the convention center, because we're going to be fully staffed. Okay. 26 and 27th. 20, 26 and 27th, excuse me. Do you have an estimate of the number of individuals in the city who have criminal records? I know it's a large number. Yeah, I don't yeah. know what that number is. I do know that we have at least 10,000 returning citizens. Yeah. That, that's a good number right there, exactly. We're very excited about this. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can you say and spell your name and title, please? Yes. Quentin Herbert, that's Q-U-I-N-T-O-N-H-E-R-B-E-R-T, -E -E Acting Director and Chief Human Capital Officer for Human Resources. Uh, one other big announcement. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, everybody knows that our own Ray Lewis has been inducted into uh, the Football Hall of Fame, and we want to do a parade in his honor, and so we will. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Tanya Miller explain uh, the parade and what's going to take place. Tanya Miller. Hi, good morning. Um, yep, we're going to have a parade. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have a parade for Ray Lewis on September 22nd. Uh, it will start at Rash Field at the corner of Key Highway and Light Street, head north on Light, to Pratt, make a right on Pratt, and then head to City Hall, where we'll end the parade with remarks from Madam Mayor and Ray Lewis. We'll have a fan festival here as well, but we're really excited and we're pairing some of this activity with what's happening at Raven Stadium for the weekend, the Ray Lewis Day weekend, Hall of Fame weekend, that the Ravens have a bunch of activities happening on Sunday as well. 
Uh, any questions no, for me? I, I didn't want to respond to this, but I was asked to ask this question about the um, Governor Hogan implying that the air conditioning was a responsibility of city schools because the city does not fund schools as much as other jurisdictions. Can you respond to that? I mean, do you feel like the state needs to do more or do you feel like the city responsibility? So I think what he's referring to is that unlike other jurisdictions, you know, as I, I think I've explained this before, in 1997 when we separated the school system from the city, the money prior to that used to come directly to the city. It doesn't. It goes directly to the school system. An example is the city school system has a $1.8 billion operating budget for 80,000 children. I have a $2.8 billion operating budget for the entire city. So um, their money goes directly to the school system. Are you saying the school system did not do what it should have done to take care of the air conditioning for city students? I think there was a report where they laid out the outline in terms of uh, being on target for providing what they're supposed to do. Uh, so. You know, again, I don't operate the school system. We did go back to the General Assembly, as you well know, to gain control of the school board. We've had the opportunity to appoint two of their nine members of the school board. Mayor, the um, staffing report that was done by the Police Foundation of the Baltimore Police Department and has now been publicized because it's part of the consent decree right. process and the independent monitor has reviewed it um, and posted it. Um, it is um, pretty clear that the problem isn't a lack of positions in the police department. The problem is a lack of priority and prioritizing. Well, I think, I think it's debatable, um, Jane, when you think about 2015-16, uh, when we froze police positions in this city and you had an attrition rate of 20 to 25 police officers a month, you were losing every single month, and you froze the hiring of police officers. And I saw uh, Governor, former mayor of Baltimore, Martin O'Malley, just uh, at the game last week and he was telling me he had 3,000 officers when he was uh, the mayor of the city and when I walked in the door we had under 2,000. So um, when you lose that many officers I think that's uh, something that the report absolutely does point out that we are understaffed in terms of patrol and the other thing is that you know our shift uh, plan is in our collective bargaining agreement. We believe that we'll come to a resolution hopefully by the end of the year as it relates to that. If we had 3,000 officers, we could probably do a four and three, but with the, the current uh, staffing of the police department, uh, it is just, it's not, it's unconscionable. As you well know, we've got police officers now working 15 hour days and it just shouldn't be. But the re what the report makes clear is that the vacancy rate on the patrol side is 26%, but on the non-patrol side, it's only 1.9%. Right. So when, I, when I said, when they talk about prioritizing, what, their, what the report states is that the decisions of leadership have been to, you know, keep the non-patrol units fully staffed, but not patrol. So, so how do you fix that? Well, again, first of all, I think that what you found leaving were more patrol officers than you did the command staff. The command staff wasn't leaving. You know, um, our police department uh, was understaffed, underpaid, and I think in this last raise that we gave, we are now equal to that in um, other jurisdictions around the, the state. And the other thing that we're looking at is how we do pay our patrol. In other cities, there's a patrol one, two, three, and four. I think we discussed that earlier, where you make sure that you're rewarding those who are on the streets. And the other thing is keeping them on the streets so they become a part of the community for a longer period of time. I think we've been promoting some officers a lot sooner than if you look in other cities, for example, in other cities where they take four years or five years before you can move to be a sergeant because, you know, we want you on the street, we want you to understand the streets, but at the same time, there's a patrol one, two, three, I know New Orleans does that, some other cities do that, and that's what we're looking at because we've got to pay attention to the folks who are on the streets. But, but, so are you talking about a pay scale that... Uh, right, equals what other jurisdictions and, and states are doing. Can, can you give an example of how they, who does it that way? Uh, New Orleans does it that way. Madam Mayor, the uh, chair of the Civilian Review Board sent you this letter a couple days ago asking to meet with you, the police department, the city solicitor, to get together and discuss this issue of internal affairs files not being handed over. Haven't seen to, it. Well, do you need to intervene and work out? I think I have to read it first. I'll read it and then I'll respond to it. Sure, but the, the, this issue of internal affairs files being shared with the Civilian Review Board has been going on for a few weeks now, and the city solicitor and 
you know, the Civilian Review Board are going back and forth on it. Do you need to intervene and work out the, these differences? I think when we get to that point, if necessary, I will. that was beat up by Arthur Williams, the former police officer of the BPD. His lawyers are saying that they're going to file a civil suit in addition to their criminal suit that the uh, city uh, state's attorney is filing. Um, there's been this argument going back and forth whether the city will pay for officers, you know, uh, not doing their jobs. What's, what's the status on that? I have no idea. They're going back and forth, so we have to wait till they get to whatever conclusions they get to. I don't have any idea. I'm not the attorneys in this case. Um, the city solicitor hey, was he? Uh, I'm not aware. Okay. Um, Madam, can you talk about your support for the um, ballot issue that would, you know, create a public campaign finance funding? We just we were doing a story on that. I just wanted to know why you decided to support that. And if, you do, if you do, I think you signed it, right? Is it ballot? I think I also I I support a public campaign financing at the state level as well. Um, it's not something that I'm personally interested in, uh, but for those who might need it, good luck. So you don't need it because you got plenty of donors. Uh, no, what I'm saying is that you know I just respect the right of people to go out and ask their friends and family and others to support them. But do you support having a city having some sort of way for people to publicly finance their campaign? I don't know what that way might be. I think what we did was put it on the ballot so people can make a decision as to whether they want to do that or not. And then I think you got to figure out where the resources come from. Because, you know, we've got some other priorities in the city as it relates to uh, home ownership, reducing violence in our city, um, you know, a lot of issues before that. Uh, Madam Mayor, what, yes, sir. What do you think about, you know, what's going on at Harbor Place and with Ashkenazi? As you know, we've had a bunch of closings this summer. There was another one recently with Poetry. Um, there's a lot of people in the business community specifically that feel like there's a dump where there should be a crown jewel in the middle of our inner harbor. So I think it is being redeveloped. When I was in Las Vegas um, this past uh, uh, meeting of all the various retailers and organizations. I did meet with them and they promised me that they were going to step up their process. Uh, we do have some new stores down there as you well see. Banana Republic has moved in. It's Sugar has moved in. Um, you know, but some of the old folks are, are moving out. Uh, but at the same time, I think you see some great stores that are coming in that area. Are you satisfied with how it's moving forward? I want it to move faster, faster, faster. And Las Vegas was the last time you Last time was the, uh, well, that was the first time that I had a sit down conversation. We've since had a conversation as well. We've asked them to speed up the process and I think that they're working in that direction. When was the last time? Uh, I don't have the exact date. I know the hurricane has switched directions uh, rapidly in the past few hours, days, whichever. Um, but there's, a, there's concern that the Inner Harbor and other parts of Bells Point and Southeast Baltimore could be affected. Are you at all concerned? Or what, what's the biggest concern? So um, we had a press conference earlier this week uh, about emergency management. The areas that we're concerned about, Fells Point would be one of those, Frederick Road would be another. And so uh, we talked about emergency services that we'll be providing. Uh, we'll be watching uh, the storm as it moves up the um, East Coast. Uh, sandbags and all of those things. We're going to make sure that those are available in those areas. Um, but we also talked about the need to fix some of those areas in a better way because we've got a system that's broken as it relates to our old piping system. As you know, we're under federal mandate to fix those and we will. Thank you, everybody.